Thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the symposium. Um, or this is adherence to confront resistance, social and behavioral interventions in Latin America. I realize we have competition with the elimination in Latin America symposium going on at the same time. It was very unfortunate because some of our speakers for the symposium also are in that, and the conference scheduled it at the same time. I tried to get them to change it as soon as I saw it. But it was all, it meant that everything else has to be changed just too much. So we had to say, okay, and find new speakers, scramble, <laughs> and we managed. And thank you very much for my uh, new speakers. Um, and thanks for everybody that came in. I think it's a very relevant topic. And uh, I'll hand it over to my co-chair, Sydney Mejia. And before that, I'll just say that I'm a professor at Tulane University in New Orleans. Sydney, introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Sydney Mejia, and um, I was originally um, Dr. Rajan's student when we made this symposium. So, um, the special socio-cultural context in Latin America, where people share unique social structures and cultural norms, lead to special challenges to TB control, especially in the area of treatment. Stigma plays an important role at societal, programmatic, and even governmental levels. In addition, family dynamics, social support and socioeconomic status directly influence access and adherence. Um, lessons learned will be shared, including successes, failures, as well recommendations that are adaptable to other situations. Thank you, Sydney. So we're going to start with the presentation about work in Peru from Carlton Evans, and then we'll move on to Brazil. Uh, as you see then on the slide, and I'm going to read it all out, then Colombia, and end up with um, um, Alberto here, who is from Mexico originally, but works in California and works all over Latin America. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Carlton to the stage, and I'll just introduce him. Carlton Evans is a professor of global health at Imperial College, London, in the, U in the UK, and also at Cayetano Heredia University in Peru, where he leads the TB research group. He's also been working for 16 years in Peru uh, with an NGO called IFHAD, which is Innovation for Health and Development. He has mentored uh, my students and has been an amazing mentor and has done a lot of behavioral studies, social st and you know, stigma studies, et cetera, in um, urban, urban TB, right? In, in Peru. Do we have? Okay. okay. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation, which is a, a real honor for me to present this work on behalf of these co-authors and all of our multidisciplinary uh, research team in, uh, in the shanty towns around Lima, Peru. So I'd like to start off with some, uh, some background and then go on to describe the research that we're doing trying to address the problem. So we all know that Peru deaths and case notification rates uh, go up and down, it's less well known that they often go up and down in, in opposite directions in neighboring countries concurrently. Uh, and this, as you can see in this graph here. Uh, and the World Health Organization uh, a couple of years ago published a, a, a study investigating the factors that were associated over the last 15 years with changes in case notification rates for, for tuberculosis globally. Uh, and the results are particularly important for this talk. Uh, here you can see one of the example graphs. They looked at the change in TB rates in every country in the world over the last 15 years, whether the rates were increasing or decreasing, and looked at what factors were associated with those changes. And what they found was really quite fascinating. There was no hint of any association whatsoever between any indicators of TB control program activities, DOTS uptake, TB diagnostics or treatment spending and changes in TB rates. So TB control programs really are a misnomer. Really TB programs are diagnosing and treating TB. They're curing and saving millions of lives, but they're not having any detectable impact upon global TB rates. Rather it's uh, socioeconomic factors as, uh, as listed here, which were strongly associated with changes in TB rates. So what your TB program is doing is very important for how many lives are saved, 
and how much suffering is relieved, uh, but doesn't have any detectable impact upon TB rates, which rather increase as countries get poorer and decrease as countries get richer. And, and we've seen a similar phenomenon locally in the shanty towns where we work, that when we follow up people who are exposed to tuberculosis, their access to health care doesn't predict their prognosis significantly. The two strongest predictors of whether or not they get sick with tuberculosis disease are shown here, poverty and underweight. Not only do poorer people, not only are poorer people more likely to get TB, but of course TB makes you poorer. So Peru has a model TB program and all TB diagnostic tests, care and treatment are completely free of direct charges. But again and again, patients describe not being able to afford to complete their treatment, which seems very puzzling when all the care and treatment is free. So uh, in work led by Tom Wingfield, we, we investigated this phenomenon and explored in depth with TB affected households why it was that they described TB costs as preventing them from completing TB treatment, TB diagnosis and treatment, when all those tests and pills were, were free of charge. And this rather uh, uh, astonishing slide just shows that during the entire illness, pre-treatment, during treatment, during the intensive phase and continuation phase of free treatment, there, there, there are very considerable costs listed individually here. Direct costs of things like food and travel and symptomatic medicines that, that, that TB-affected households have to live with, approximately equal in total to the lost income that people living with tuberculosis often, uh, often experience through their ill health or through stigma and marginalization. So even free TB care can be too expensive for, for impoverished households to afford. And this is a, 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 a rather uh, complex slide, but as, as you see um, uh, along the lower axis here, the total household TB-related expenses as a, as a proportion of annual household income, you can see a peak here in the population attributable fraction of how much those costs predict adverse TB treatment outcome. And astonishingly, when you compare those catastrophic costs with multidrug resistance, you find that catastrophic TB-related costs are responsible for as many adverse outcomes as multidrug resistant TB in this setting, in this setting where 10 or 11% of all patients have multidrug resistant TB. Now, of course, that's not to belittle the importance of multidrug resistance. It's just to show that actually not being, having catastrophic TB-related costs, not being able to afford to access care, is just as bad for your prognosis, just as bad for your chance of getting cured as if you have multidrug resistant TB. Which is really quite astonishing when you think that this whole conference is all about this. The title of the conference is all about drug resistance. And, and so much less is said about catastrophic costs and how hard it is for people living with TB to, to actually access uh, TB care and to complete TB treatment. But of course, poverty uh, and, the, and the social determinants of TB aren't all about money. And here are some remarkable slides uh, that, that, that show that, for example, just how much you know about TB the day that you're diagnosed, in a simple questionnaire, your, your, your understanding of TB, your basic knowledge about TB, actually predicts your, your, your long-term prognosis. If you're relatively uninformed about TB at the time you're diagnosed, you're much more likely to have TB recurrence in the future. Social capital is a, is a more abstract concept than knowledge. People tend to summarize social capital uh, as, um, uh, as, as how safe and supported and um, integrated you feel in, in your community. Sometimes it's, uh, it's summarized as how many friends you have, although it's a bit more complicated than that. And there's a great deal of interest in social capital in uh, public health circles because social capital is one of the strongest predictors of um, longevity, health, and healthcare uptake 
in elderly people. So our governments are actually investing a lot in trying to increase elderly people's social capital to try to reduce health spending. Okay? Uh, very little is known about social capital in tuberculosis, and we, we studied social capital in the shanty towns where, where, we, where we work around Lima. And we found that TB patients had much lower social capital. They felt much more isolated and marginalized than the people they were living with uh, and other people in those communities, which isn't surprising for, any of, for, for, for those of us who have any experience of tuberculosis. It's a stigmatizing, marginalizing condition. But what's even more remarkable is that the higher the social capital score, the more likely, at the time of diagnosis, the more likely these, these patients were to be unable to complete their treatment, so-called abandonment. They couldn't complete their treatment, and they were also more likely to die. Stigma has, 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 has already been mentioned. We, we, we used a very simple stigma scale, asking people, TB patients, people living with TB, uh, about their experience of stigma. And you can see here from 0 to 60% that uh, almost all the patients described experiencing some aspects of, of stigma. And again, that's, just, that's not just unpleasant for them. That's really important because those reports of stigma uh, early on in the disease predicted um, uh, inability to complete their treatment. So again, people who felt more stigmatized were less likely to complete their therapy. So um, uh, finally, in this, in this part of the talk, we, we, we also uh, asked, uh, used the Beck Depression Inventory to ask people living with TB, the people with them, and other people in the community uh, 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 about how depressed they felt. And you can see that there was a strong association between tuberculosis, uh, poverty, uh, and depression, shown in this, this graph here. Uh, and you can also uh, see here that it wasn't just an abstract questionnaire scale. Actually, there were significant associations between poverty and tuberculosis and, and considering suicide. Tuberculosis was, was independently, strongly associated uh, with, uh, uh, with depression along with poverty, independent of poverty. Uh, and again, people who were depressed at the time that they were diagnosed were, were significantly less likely to successfully complete their therapy. Okay? So poverty, not just about money, but also about these other uh, psychosocial aspects, uh, aspects of TB. Uh, another important point to mention is that we often think about um, uh, adherence, completion of TB treatment as, as, a, as, a, as a yes or no, black and white phenomenon. Uh, but actually, um, uh, many of us believe that to take TB treatment intermittently, on and off, until eventually completing it after perhaps twice as long as that course of therapy was intended to take, may be even worse than, than, than abandoning, not completing the treatment, because it can generate multidrug resistant TB. So sometimes it may actually uh, be less bad for a patient to abandon therapy than to be encouraged to take treatment on and off over prolonged periods. Uh, and, and that's demonstrated by, by these data from the, the shanty towns where we work, that, that, that patients, there are few patients, took their six months of therapy over seven months or more. Okay? And those who took their treatment over more than 10% too long had, had a significantly, considerably increased risk uh, of having a recurrence of their tuberculosis. So, uh, so intermittent therapy, therapy taken on and off, uh, is, 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 is not adequate. And of course, according to global policies, most TB programs only consider that a patient has, has defaulted from, has abandoned TB treatment if they don't take any pills at all for a month or two. So, so these... Uh, this, this issue of intermittent treatment adherence is, is, is rather hidden amongst uh, global, global statistics. And then finally, looking at the, looking at the problem itself, uh, here you can see um, uh, some data from a prevalence survey that we did of, of households in which someone had in previous years been diagnosed with, uh, in, in which someone had previously been um, uh, diagnosed with, uh, with, with tuberculosis. Uh, and we found, uh, as, as, uh, as most global prevalence surveys have, have, have found, 
that only about half of the tuberculosis that we found in these TB-affected households were, was in people who were engaging with the healthcare system. And the other half was in people who were just at home, not having sought any care uh, for, the, for their symptoms. So this is like the silent half of tuberculosis. Uh, and we found that risk factors for having undiagnosed tuberculosis in, in the supposedly healthy members of the community uh, are shown here along the bottom of the slide. And I won't read them out to you, but, but, but as you can see, several social determinants of tuberculosis, not only associated with the tuberculosis that we know about, that we're diagnosing and treating in health centers and hospitals, but also in the other half of tuberculosis, which is out there in the community, uh, not currently engaging with, uh, with healthcare systems. So this association between the social determinants of TB and, 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 and TB death, TB case notifications, is, uh, is, is, is quite dynamic. Look at these huge peaks in TB deaths associated with both world wars, for example. So we, we set out to, uh, to ask whether uh, there was anything that we could do to, addru to address these social determinants of tuberculosis, to try to improve tuberculosis outcomes and also prevent tuberculosis in, in people at high risk of tuberculosis. And there's, there's two studies I'd like to d describe briefly uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. The first is ISEAT, the in Innovative Socioeconomic Intervention Against uh, TB. Uh, and, and, and this can be likened to, um, uh, to a, Chinese, uh, a Chinese restaurant, okay, where we, where we laid out all of the socioeconomic interventions in front of TB-affected households and offered them all to see which were most popular and, and to see which, which would work best, because we really didn't have uh, any, a, a, any body of evidence to, to base a decision upon about what would work or what wouldn't. So we just offered ev ev everything that we, could, uh, that we could think of in terms of uh, uh, social uh, and economic support for, for households living with a new diagnosis of, uh, of tuberculosis. Uh, and uh, what we were broadly aiming to do uh, was to uh, reduce uh, the social, social determinant risk factors for tuberculosis and, and help incentivize and enable um, uh, TB-affected households to be able to successfully access care uh, with the overall aim of, uh, of reducing TB. Uh, and uh, th these results were quite encouraging in that we saw uh, significantly uh, increased access to various indicators of, of, of TB-related care. Okay. Um, perhaps the most important results uh, when we compared the uh, eight communities where, where we were offering this support to, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to eight other communities uh, uh, which were not receiving the support, and in fact it was a stepped wedge phased implementation design, so uh, in fact some of the data was from all 16 communities, a, um, a, 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 a clever study design, we found that um, firstly... Uh, in the households that weren't offered the socioeconomic support, uh, as, as you would expect from the inverse care law, that the poorer households, which are most at risk of TB, were the ones that were least likely to access free preventive therapy. Okay, so in this setting, preventive therapy is offered to everyone under, excuse me, everyone under the age of uh, 15 years. It's recommended to them who's living with a TB patient. And you would hope that the poorer households uh, most at risk of TB would be the ones most likely to access it, but as, as one would expect from the inverse care laws, the opposite is true. The highest risk poorer households are the least likely to access this free preventive therapy. And, and, and pleasingly, encouragingly, the um, socioeconomic support doubled the uptake of, uh, of, 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 of isoniazid preventive therapy uh, and also uh, re reversed this, this, this inequality, which is, uh, which is encouraging. And these results are all uh, are all published now from this, uh, from this initial ISEAT study. Uh, before I come on to the final study, uh, I'd just like to um, uh, dwell for a moment on the feedback uh, that, the, uh, that, the, that the participants in this study gave us. So we asked them at the end of the study, you know, thanks for taking part, it, it's worked, it's great, it improved things. It's a, it's a glass half full. It doubled chemoprophylaxis uptake. It significantly increased 
improved other aspects of care, but it didn't get things nearly as good as we hoped. What, what worked well for you and what worked less well for you? We asked participants to rank the different things that we had offered them uh, to tell us what they felt were, were the most important to offer in future. And the, the, the answers were, to me, completely astonishing. All of the things that they ranked most highly were in terms of uh, 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 psychosocial support. Okay. And they also valued the food and money that we gave them, uh, but less so. That's not to say they didn't value these things. It was a forced ranking. Yeah, they, just ranked, they just ranked them less highly. And I, I put advocacy in black because it doesn't really... I think advocacy is very important, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think this means it's not important. I just don't think it fits very well in this, in this scale. Okay. I don't think they felt that advocacy helped them, but I think it was very important in, in other ways. Okay, and in the, uh, in, 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 in the last two or three minutes, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to tell you about the, uh, the, the other study that we've recently completed, again led by, by Tom Wingfield for his, his PhD with us, um, uh, the, 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 the Cresset pilot study, which, uh, which Tom led. Uh, and, and in this, we took the parts of this ISEAT um, buffet restaurant sort of approach. We took the things that worked best and only offered them. So now a much more structured, uh, much, more, much better defined, much easier to reproduce uh, intervention, offering uh, just peer support from recovering TB patients during household visits and community workshops, together with conditional cash transfers. Take your pills, get your tests, take your chemoprophylaxis, and we'll give you a little bit of money to incentivize and enable you to do so. And, and this, initial, this initial phase, the pilot phase, which is finished and is uh, half published, the other half is, is under review at the moment, um, uh, was a simple study to try to uh, uh, develop and define the, the intervention. Uh, and, and as you can see, about 100, 140 households, TB-affected households, randomized between being offered this support or not offered the support. Um, and uh, here you can see some of the statistics about, uh, about what was given. Uh, which, uh, which I won't read out to you. And, and the results, again, were, 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 were very, very encouraging. Again, we managed to, to, to double the uptake of, uh, of chemoprophylaxis offered free by the TB program. We didn't offer any treatment or, or pills or, or care. We, we just supported uh, these impoverished TB-affected households to try to better access the excellent care offered free of charge by the TB program. And as you can see, offering this... Uh, socioeconomic support approximately doubled uh, uptake of chemoprophylaxis, uh, but again left a lot of people without chemoprophylaxis. Again, a, a glass half full, half empty, but a significant effect, and uh, also uh, considerably increased the proportion of patients who were su successfully cured of their uh, of, of their of their tuberculosis. So, uh, encouraging uh, encouraging results, uh, and again, this is my penultimate slide. Just astonishing that when we asked the participants to rank what they valued the most. I, I, I felt sure they would say the money that you're giving us, we're poor, we're hungry, you're giving us money just for taking our pills and getting our tests. As you saw on the yellow slide, almost everyone got almost all the money. And yet, astonishingly, here you can see again that it was the, the psychosocial support, the peer support, which people valued most. And the conditional cash transfers, the money, the money for what most of them were going to do anyway significant amounts, amounts of money to these people. It wasn't uh, uh, underrated by them. It was just less important than the psychosocial support. And uh, uh, we're now, um, uh, in fact, next week, commencing the main study in which we're randomizing 16 communities to receive this psychosocial socioeconomic support package compared with 16 other communities which will just receive standard of care to see whether these encouraging results can translate into a, a, actually improved um, a, a community control and prevention of, of, of tuberculosis. And I'd just like to finish by acknowledging uh, that these organizations that have kindly sponsored, kindly funded this work, and, and to emphasize that all this work that I've described has been done by, by this really inspiring multidisciplinary team that I have the great pleasure of working with in Peru. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Carlton. If there are any questions, we'll take one or two now and then save most of it for the end when we can have a group discussion as a group. Any questions? Yes, yes, so the back there, Sydney. Um, just a question about adherence. Um, since we see that some patients don't necessarily value the cash incentivization to adhere to chemoprophylaxis, do we have a profile of what patients who don't complete look like? Do they differ in some way socioeconomically or maybe in their mental health? Or how do they differ from adherence? Yeah, but thank, thank, thank you very much. So I'd, 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 I'd just like to start by emphasizing that people did greatly value the, 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 the food and money support in the first project and, 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 the, and the money support in the, in the second project. And so when, when we asked them, how much did you value this, the, 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 the ratings were very high, yeah? as, as you'd expect. You gave me money, I rate that very highly, thank you. The, the, the more interesting result is just when we force people to rank them, uh, the, the, the money came last after the psychosocial support, which I think is, is uh, uh, at, at this very exciting time when um, uh, um, social protection has become part of the global TB, recommend, TB control recommendation. I think that's a very important uh, lesson to, uh, to bear in mind. And um, uh, the, the, the risk factors for, for intermittent TB treatment adherence, and for so-called abandoning uh, inability to, to complete uh, TB treatment uh, are, are very similar in these shanty towns to, to most global reports and meta-analyses. And, and poverty is one of the strongest risk factors. Uh, incom school incompletion, lack of education as it's sometimes phrased, uh, is, is another. Uh, depression uh, and, and mental health issues, uh, alcohol and substance abuse, homelessness and ex-incarceration. Are the, are, the, are, the, are the strongest risk factors, um, which, is, which is sobering because uh, as, as a team trying to help address these problems, some of those problems are, are obviously extremely challenging to, to, to try to address. Poverty in some ways is, the, uh, is not the hardest of them all. Thank you, Carlson. So we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, Sorry. Danielle Pelisari, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, social protection um, in Brazil. Uh, Danielle is an epidemiologist with a master's in public health, currently a PhD student. The NTP program manager, uh, Denise Arakaki, is here, who was originally meant to give this talk. She's allowing her PhD student to give it instead. The same, uh, same slides, I think, right? All right, thank you. And uh, if I need some help, I will ask her. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for Union for this uh, opportunity. Um, I'm not uh, an author of this work, this study, but uh, Anna Torrens, that is the first author, used to work with us in NTP, but now she's at uh, MSF, and she uh, kindly shared this, this presentation with us because she couldn't come for the conference. So the study that I'm going to present is effectiveness of a conditional cash transfer program on to be curate, a retrospective court study in Brazil. Uh, so Brazil is a country uh, with uh, continental dimension. And we are in 2015, 200 million inhabitants in 27 states. And although, uh, although we look, uh, we seem to be a rich country, our Gini coefficient in 2014 was 0 0.5. Uh, in our system, uh, per year we have uh, 7,000 new cases, and uh, we are experiencing since the end of the 90s a decline in TB instance and mortality. But our cure rate is not uh, uh, good enough, so in 2012 was 70% in new TB cases. And the end to be strategy identifies conditional cash transfer interventions as powerful tools to improve TB control indicators. So the authors in this, in this study, they evaluated the role of the Bolsa Familia program on TB rates in Brazil. 
Bolsa Family Programs is the largest uh, cash transfer program in the world. It is a retrospective cohort study, and this cohort was formed uh, considering the linkage uh, of two databases. The first one is the Notifiable Disease Information System, that is from NTP, and has national coverage. And at the last report of WHO, they estimated that we, we are notifying 87% of the cases in the systems in Brazil, and includes to be individual data, uh, uh, some variables like social, economic, and clinical are also available in this uh, database. And the second database that they used was uh, Cade Único, that is a database which includes um, individuals who are eligible for social assistance or government programs, such as Bolsa Familia program. And we have a registry in Cade Único about uh, 80. 8 million uh, um, individuals in Brazil that uh, has a, any vulnerability to receive a government program. In 2010, uh, 71,000 uh, of cases were notified in SINA, that is the NTP system. Some of them had to be excluded because they, were, uh, they didn't have diagnosis confirmed. 76% uh, it's very small. 76% were not registered in CAD Unico. That's, that means that they didn't have any vulnerability, vulnerability to be eligible for this, uh, this program. 10% were regist registered in CAD Unico, but not uh, Bolsa Familia Beneficiari. It's, it means that they had some vulnerability, but not for Bolsa Familia. So they, are, they were receiving other, other uh, social assistance. And finally, 13% uh, were registered in Cade Unico and Bolsa Familia. We had some to do some exclusion criteria, and uh, also we had to exclude uh, multi uh, MDR cases because there were only 25 uh, cases in this, in this sample. And uh, the study population uh, was uh, TB cases that were registered in Cade Unico and Bolsa Familia. It split it in two groups. The first one for those that were receiving Bolsa Familia during treatment. This represented 79% of the cases. And the second one, uh, they um, were eligible to receive Bolsa Familia, but they were not receiving during treatment, which represented uh, 20%. They conduct a multivariate analysis, and the dependent variable was treatment outcome, and then compared the cure or, uh, with no cure rates. And the main independent variable was uh, receiving Bolsa Familia program cash transfer during treatment. Uh, they adjust by potential confounders that were found uh, in literature associated with the outcomes and use the Poisson regression with robust variances to estimate uh, relative risk and confidence interval. So uh, after excluding missing information, a total of 7,255 individuals were excluded. 79% were receiving uh, cash transfer during the treatment, and the mean value of the benefits uh, received uh, monthly was uh, $55. Um, the cure rate among patients uh, exposed to both familia during treatment was 82%. And 76% uh, among those patients that were not receiving Bolsa Familia during treatment. So this table shows demographic and clinical characteristics uh, of the study population according to Bolsa Familia benefits exposure. And uh, as we can see, a majority of cases were female and uh, were 15 to 49 years old, uh, black and uh, pulmonary form. To be formed. Also, uh, most of them were negative to HIV, didn't have diabetes, or uh, didn't consume alcohol, and outcomes I, I already showed the results. Uh, in the multivariable analysis, uh, what they saw is that uh, patients, TB patients that were receiving Bolsa Familia, 
were 7% more likely to uh, be cured when compared with those that were not receiving doing treatment. And uh, that's, that is uh, adjusted by age, AdSense uh, diabetes, HIV, uh, clinical form for TB, and also some other social economic indicators. I think I present very fast. <laughs> I'm all, I am already my conclusions. So these results support. Uh, I can I can share you my minutes. <laughs> Um, this result supports the last recommendation included uh, in the WHO NTB strategy. Uh, in Brazil, this is the first and the only evidence that we have of uh, effectiveness of a cash transfer program in TB cure rate. So as is the only study in Brazil, we can't assume uh, causality. So we need more rigorous studies to, to see the impact uh, and process evaluation. And, and to uh, launch a politic that uh, implement this, this benefits for all TB cases in Brazil. So I'd like to thank uh, NTP and the uh, UNA conference and also the, all the universities that helped uh, UNA and NTP in this study. That's it. <laughs> Anybody have a questions for Danieli? I had a quick question because I was looking at the numbers in the intervention versus control, and they're pretty close, 80-something versus 70. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think because we have a, a large sample, yeah. so any uh, small difference uh, get a significant result. So in multivariate yeah. analysis, we saw that, uh, that... That's what I was getting at. What was the yeah. p-value? What was? The p-value. Do, do you have any... Oh, the just the inter yeah, just the confidence in interval. That is significant. No, but you go to the the total, the previous slide. Previous. This slide. one. Previous. Before. Oh, it was significant. I I have to cut because of the. Uh, did you would want what was? I wanted to ask about this. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, these numbers. It's the same here. Oh. So, sorry, um, it's the same here. Okay. And uh, I had to cut the p-valuable. Uh, they use a uh, uh, qui, um, how can I say? Que quadrado? Key square. Key square. Yeah, they use key square here, and this is, uh, is significant. But I have to cut the table because of the, the size. And I, uh, I only show the multivariate right. analysis. Because I just wondered, because we just heard from Peru that it doubled, <laughs> right? The doubled up in uptake. So um, I yeah. just wondered, and I wondered whether your baseline is already high. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, uh, I think there are other problems, like uh, limitations uh, about. I didn't hear you. Sorry? No, the, the Peru, just yeah. before. The, pre the first presentation, here. It was in the video, yeah. I think uh, what you could explain is the selection of the, the sample, because it's a linkage of two databases and we might have missing some cases. Uh, for example, in Cade Unico, uh, the, ch the common chief from the family, it's the woman. So as we can see, the distribution by the gender here, is different what we saw, we see in our national system. It's more fem female than male. So it might be, have some limitation at the linkage of the two databases. That, that linkage was not uh, performed by uh, the students, uh, it was performed by the so social ministry. Mm -hmm. So we really received the, the database uh, already done. Yeah. That could be a limitation. Yeah. Thanks, it's a fabulous, and really exciting presentation. Um, when, when you looked at the, the, the reason that, that, that some people were not cured, could, could, you, could you see any trend, any suggestion of, of, of how the bolts are familiar 
conditional cash transfers seem to be making the improvement? Was it mainly probably reducing treatment abandonment, treatment default? Or, 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 we or didn't look it, that. Is it not possible to tell? No, with, with this database, we can't do, do, do that analysis. But uh, uh, they discussed that it, it, uh, we need more study to, uh, to understand what are the, the phenomena that uh, is conducting this uh, increasing in Q rate. Thank you. Anybody another question? Or we'll move on if not. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, um, so our next speaker, uh, Sandra Patricia Escandon uh, Moncaliano, is a social communicator with the NGO uh, Fonande, which is a recipient of the Global Fund. She has experience in designing and implementing adv advocacy strategies and in communication and social mobilization that focuses on behavioral change. For the past 15 years, she has been working with vulnerable populations to increase adherence. Buenos días. Eh, voy a hablar en, en español y voy a tener el apoyo de, de, de una... Oh, sorry. Bueno, gracias y buenos días y gracias por permitirnos eh, presentar este trabajo de Colombia en este espacio. Bueno, nosotros somos un grupo de personas del área de las ciencias de la salud y las ciencias sociales que trabajamos en diseñar un, extra, un documento, una herramienta que nos permitiera identificar de manera oportuna y efectiva eh, los factores de riesgo de abandono de los pacientes con tuberculosis al momento de ingresar al programa. Eh, quiero, eh, antes de, de seguir, comentarles que este documento no ha sido aún aplicado como una investigación, ha sido validado con los pacientes en diferentes etapas metodológicas que les voy a compartir, pero aún no ha sido testeado en, en ninguna población para mirar el resultado tal de, del instrumento como tal. Esa es una fase siguiente que vamos a tener. Eh, esa es la situación de nuestra de Colombia. Colombia tiene 47.121.089 eh, habitantes de una tasa de incidencia de tuberculosis de 24.6 sobre 100.000 habitantes. El número de casos de tuberculosis farmacoresistente es de 12.346 para Ah, perdón, sensible, gracias. De 12.346 eh, farmacoresistencia de 137, eh, casos XDR, 4 personas, con infección un 11%, el éxito de TB sensible está en, en 78%, farmacoresistencia en 52% a 2014 y una pérdida de seguimiento del 10% en el total de la población. Estos datos a 2016, con excepción de, eh, los, del tema de farmacoresistencia. Bueno, los aspectos más relevantes que consideramos que el instrumento le aporta al, pa al país y al programa como tal es que es una herramienta que nos va a poder permitir identificar de manera oportuna eh, cuáles son esos factores de riesgo que pueden afectar en su contexto social la no adherencia a un tratamiento antituberculoso, lo cual eh, nos va a permitir también entonces diseñar estrategias oportunas y efectivas para generar la adherencia en los pacientes de acuerdo a los contextos sociales, culturales, económicos eh, y familiares que vamos a detectar en cada uno de los pacientes. Y con esto, por supuesto, lo que buscamos es mejorar eh, los indicadores y mejorar eh, de alguna manera la gestión que tiene el eje programático en Colombia. 
eh, aquí quiero que les quisimos traer una foto de un departamento que es Kipdo y son las condiciones que si bien no son las de todos los pacientes, sino unas condiciones generales de nuestros pacientes en Colombia afectados por tuberculosis, donde tienen diferentes factores que afectan, entre esos de barreras de acceso para llegar a donde están los pacientes y, y suministrar el tratamiento. El instrumento tuvo tres fases de validación. La primera fue una, eh, una fase basada en la metodología Delphi que se desarrolló con expertos nacionales e internacionales de diferentes niveles de conocimiento de las ciencias eh, de las ciencias clínicas, pero también de las ciencias de la salud, que nos permitieron entonces evaluar desde un comienzo cuáles serían este, estas dimensiones y estas preguntas para desarrollar dentro del instrumento como el instrumento mismo. La segunda correspondió a un análisis cognitivo. Eh, creemos que, queremos enfocarnos en esta presentación, en estos resultados del, de la parte cognitiva, teniendo en cuenta que creemos que aquí es donde eh, tiene mayor, eh, mayor trabajo y mayor importancia todo aquello de la percepción, del conocimiento y de tener toda esta construcción de constructor pregunta a pregunta desde el entendimiento y los diferentes, el análisis eh, cognitivo puro y cognitivo analítico que se hizo para cada una de las preguntas que vamos a compartir en adelante. Y finalmente tuvo un, eh, un análisis de confiabilidad que fue un test RITES, también con pacientes, Aquí básicamente en la, fase, en la parte cognitiva, la muestra de los pacientes tuvo unas características que fue población mayor de 18 años, eh, población afrocolombiana, por, eh, afrocolombiana, eh, farmaco, de, farmaco, farmaco resistentes, sensibles, mujeres, hombres de los diferentes sistemas de, de afiliación al servicio de salud. En Colombia tenemos el sistema subsidiado y el sistema contributivo. Contributivo es el que paga por el servicio, subsidiado es el que el Estado de alguna manera cubre eh, todo lo que tiene que ver con la atención no solo de tuberculosis, sino de cualquier evento de salud pública. Entonces fueron poblaciones que tuvimos en cuenta. Eh, también tuvimos en cuenta población privada de la libertad, población migrante. Eh, eh, tuvimos eh, te, eh, también población eh, con infección. Entonces, intentamos abordar diferentes grupos de la población para poder tener eh, pues un resultado lo más eh, eh, acorde a toda la, la condición que tiene el país. Los constructores que discutimos y que básicamente planteamos para explorar eh, tienen mucha relación con los que compartió el, el doctor de Perú que básicamente son los, los que generalmente se identifican con factores de no adherencia al tratamiento y tienen que ver con trastornos mentales, básicamente con consumo de sustancias psicoactivas. Eh, tiene que ver todo lo que, lo que representa eh, el agenciamiento personal, visto como el desarrollo que tiene el individuo de entenderse y manifestar sus, sus sensaciones y percepciones frente a un tema específico. Eh, conocimientos, actitudes y prácticas sobre la tuberculosis, pacientes previamente tratados, comorbilidades vistos desde crónicas como diabetes, básicamente exploramos este tema eh, y VIH. Ok. Eh, el instrumento es un instrumento, como les vengo diciendo, multidimensional, que nos permite entonces de esa manera tener diferentes eh, maneras de, eh, de levantar información, pero también de plantear estrategias de intervención. Tiene seis secciones. Eh, las seis secciones, la primera tiene que ver con los factores personales, con los factores socioeconómicos, con los relacionados con el tratamiento y los relacionados con servicios de salud, donde en cada uno de los seis, de los seis, secto, seis secciones se exploraron diferentes aspectos que tienen que ver con la posible no adherencia al tratamiento de los pacientes con tuberculosis. 
Estas seis secciones tuvieron dos fases de análisis de lo cognitivo, la primera fase, eh, primera y segunda fase. La primera, como les dije, tuvo que ver con un análisis de cognitivo puro, que básicamente lo que buscábamos es analizar el entendimiento que tenía cada una de las personas que hicieron parte de la muestra para entender la claridad y la, y la, y la, la claridad que tenía el tema sobre el cual se estaba indagando. Y en el análisis, en el cognitivo analítico, tiene que ver ya más con un análisis cualitativo, donde, real, donde lo que se hace ahí es explorar toda la percepción y el comportamiento que tiene una persona frente a un tema específico con respecto a lo que, a lo que indagamos desde las eh, seis secciones y estos constructor que se desarrollaron. Eh, creo que es importante también que sepan que el instrumento tiene en total 60 preguntas. Eh, entonces fue un trabajo largo y dispendioso, 60 preguntas para hacer un análisis cognitivo, un análisis de constructor uno a uno explorando objetivos de cada una de las preguntas y cada una de las cinco de las seis dimensiones que se desarrollaron. Eh, básicamente, entonces acá es eh, contarles un poco cuáles fueron las preguntas que tuvieron pros y contras. Eh, entre los pros que tuvo el análisis, el análisis cognitivo puro fue entender eh, la claridad que tenían las personas al preguntarle sobre cada una de las preguntas, sobre cada una de las preguntas que se indagó. Y en los contras y saber que en su mayoría eh, tenían buen entendimiento y tenían claridad. Eh, dentro de las barreras estuvo el tema de las termino la terminología un poco técnica con la que inicialmente iniciamos el, el la validación, pero también la parte legal. En esta parte legal eh, había dificultad en el entendimiento de la pregunta legal cuando hablamos de víctimas del conflicto, por ejemplo, uno de, las, de, los, de los ejes que se indagó en Colombia por, por el tema mismo de nuestra condición de, de país. Eh, en esos temas eh, las personas tuvieron eh, dificultad para entender y una pregunta que aparentemente parecía muy sencilla y era indagar sobre el sexo y el género de, la, de las personas. Eh, no fue tan fácil el entendimiento con respecto a sexo y género y esta pregunta la exploramos eh, eh, muchas veces y con mucho tiempo y de diferentes maneras, teniendo en cuenta eh, la relación que, eh, queríamos, eh, que queremos plasmar de coinfección vista desde población vulnerable, LGTBI. Eh, entonces, por eso fue un tema importante de explorar esto del sexo y del género eh, y nos llevó un tiempo importante de llegar a este consenso. Me quiero devolver un momentico al tema de, de víctima del conflicto. Eh, que esta mañana lo, lo reflexionábamos y era eh, con, el, con las personas que hablábamos y es que en su momento eh, planteamos el tema de víctima del conflicto como una connotación de, de ser importante para nuestra población eh, afectada por tuberculosis. Pero realmente cuando revisamos la estrategia final de la tuberculosis y nos plantea unos nuevos lineamientos de Pilar 2, de protección social, de soporte de salud, empezamos a entender que seguramente esta pregunta va a tener eh, hacerla y analizarla nos va a enriquecer mucho el, el poder generar intervenciones precisas en beneficio de los pacientes en lo que tiene que ver con soportes de sistema de salud eh, que se debe garantizar desde, desde ese nuevo pilar 2 que nos plantea la estrategia final de la tuberculosis. Okay. En el tema de, en el tema de eh, consumo de sustancias psicoactivas, básicamente de alcohol, 
eh, y abuso del alcohol, para nosotros fue importante explorar más también esta pregunta, teniendo en cuenta que se puntualizó no solamente el consumo del alcohol como tal, sino el tiempo, eh, el tiempo en que el, el, el lapso de tiempo entre, un, entre el consumo de una u otra copa de licor y adicional a eso, la cantidad de, alco de alcohol que la persona consume, las personas consumían. Entonces, para nosotros fue importante eh, explorar más y poder ser mucho más puntual en el tema de, de esta pregunta. Ok, eh, bueno, aquí vamos avanzando, voy a, voy a, voy a hablar mucho más rápido. Eh, el tema de, si bien ahí estamos hablando de eh, abuso en drogas de sustancias psicoactivas vistas como el éxtasis, el bazuco, el pegante, las drogas y, y las drogas que se obtienen en calle, había mucha confusión entre la droga y el medicamento. Otro tema que nos llevó a explorar desde lo cognitivo estos dos conceptos para poder puntualizar eh, qué era droga y qué era medicamento y de esa misma manera plantear las preguntas y evitar la confusión por parte de las personas que, que estaban siendo indagadas. Eh, también se preguntó, estos fueron los mapas eh, conceptuales que creamos para cada una de las preguntas, solamente pues trajimos por supuesto el de, el de las drogas, el del medicamento y drogas para tenerlo como ejemplo, pero cada pregunta tiene su mapa conceptual de construcción y de discusión. Eh, otra de las preguntas que se trabajó fue lo, la exploración de miedos que tienen las personas con respecto a un diagnóstico de tuberculosis, eh, y hay temor con respecto al tema, sin embargo, eh, el trabajo del personal de salud y los preconceptos que se tienen con respecto a la enfermedad ayuda a, 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 a manejar estos miedos, pero hay mucho miedo y temor con respecto a la, a la, a la enfermedad y al estigma, que igual también lo, lo planteaban, fue otro de los temas que se exploró dentro de las dimensiones de trabajo. Y como conclusiones, básicamente, eh, pues estamos convencidos que esta es una herramienta que nos va a dar elementos para para documentar y sistematizar realmente, eh, tener más conocimiento sobre los factores de riesgo de abandono y de esa misma manera precisar las estrategias de manera mucho más puntual que, que se requieren para cada uno de los pacientes en sus contextos sociales, políticos y económicos y eso nos permitirá seguramente mejorar esta, este tema de adherencia y por supuesto la, la misma condición de vida de los pacientes que son afectados por tuberculosis en el país. Creo que Listo, gracias. gracias. So, uh, for Sandra? Entonces, están algunas imágenes de nuestros pacientes. Could you say it one more time loudly? Yeah. In one sentence, how can we measure the agency of people receiving social support and treatment? Social support and treatment. De la herencia, ¿cómo se da? Ok, pues como, como le decía al comienzo, ese es un instrumento eh, que está diseñado para iniciar su implementación. O sea, si en este momento, si, si hoy, si en este momento quisiéramos saber qué tan efectivo es el, el documento para eh, generar intervenciones muy puntuales en el contexto de cada uno de los pacientes, eh, esa es una segunda fase que tenemos planteada y no la, hemos, no la hemos desarrollado porque es entregar el documento y entregar ese instrumento para que un grupo de investigadores haga, o nosotros mismos, y el país en cada una de sus instituciones haga eh, el, el diligenciamiento del instrumento, el análisis del instrumento y eh, la intervención directa de, en cada uno de los pacientes de acuerdo a su condición de riesgo identificado desde una de esas eh, seis secciones que mostramos. Uh, refuse treatment or abandon treatment, and it's really just in that early phase 
or, or the, the principal phase of developing the instrument. So it doesn't quite get to your particular issue, but that is the purpose for the work that they've been engaged in. Thank you, Jessica. Nothing. Yes? Say those six areas. Las seis areas. In English. We're, we're going, I, I gotta have the slide because I can't see, I don't remember the slide. La primera, the que tiene las seis areas. Right there. So those are the six sections that you have. So the first is identification, gender, uh, the general social demographics, personal factors including drug and alcohol consumption. The third is family in terms of social support and networks and uh, determining the quality of such, the economic factors such as socioeconomic status, responsibilities. So it's, is it possible to get a job? Five factors related to treatment such as the numbers of medicine, knowledge of adverse effects, and the effectiveness, and six factors related to the healthcare service and personnel, such as can you get to those treatments, condition of the treatment provided, and general satisfaction with health services. No? Did Dr. Evans find those factors relevant to his recognition <laughs> of the important area? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I think that. They're very comprehensive. I think that we're uh, uh, working with, with different titles, different headings, mm -hmm. but the same information. I think this is excellent. Entendí la mitad. La pregunta fue si el trabajo que el doctor está manejando son las mismas áreas y el doctor dice que sí, aunque los nombres son un poco diferentes y importante para manejar. Sí, cuando vi la presentación del doctor, pues finalmente son las mismas cinco dimensiones, las mismas seis dimensiones que pues revisando la documentación que se hace en este estado de arte para cualquier investigación. Eh, nos las arroja. Seguramente hay algunas que pueden cambiar por el contexto social de Colombia, más por nombre que por, eh, por eh, objetivo mismo de la, para la, de, de la sección. Thank you so much. So we'll move on. Thank you, Sandra. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> solo, solo nos falta, nos falta conseguir socios como los del doctor para poder presentar el resultado de la de la, de la implementación. Right. She needs to have a team like Muy buenos socios. Yeah. Okay. To do the implementation. All right. Some funding to come <laughs> to do the follow up. You don't have this? No. So our next speaker is Alberto uh, Colorado. Mm, Alberto. Uh, he is, is uh, oh. oh, sorry, somebody said something? No, just how to get to his slides. Oh, okay, it's the next slide, just, just arrow, yeah. There you go. Ta -da. Ta -da. So he has an NGO, uh, Activistas, right? Activistas. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it's based in California, but he works all over Latin America and is mainly uh, uh, an activist. Um, so you, you're hearing a civil, so a civil society perspective from him. And he has a lot of good ideas, and I think it'll be a very interactive, very fun uh, uh, presentation. Well, thank you. And thank very you very much. Informative. Thank Please you don't take much. more of my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think it's a uh, great, um, at least that you survived uh, here for the last uh, day of the conference. And I know we're competing with the elimination of um, tuberculosis in the Americas. And here I'm proposing the elimination of bureaucracy in tuberculosis in the Americas. So because unfortunately, uh, my presentation is not about uh, uh, the quantitative uh, effects of any, any project that is done in Latin America, but it's more from the voices of those communities who are being affected by tuberculosis and the otherwise nobody's looking at them and unfortunately some of them are dying. So my, my, my presentation here is um, to just present the voices of, of those communities. Um, thank you for uh, occupying uh, your symposium. I think it's great and, and I, I'd be happy to, um, uh, to have uh, some uh, reflections of what's going on. As you can see, um, I have a question mark on the NTV because um, actually in Latin America, uh, the issue is uh, how to end the bureaucracy and tuberculosis because uh, this looks so far away 
from our own realities to really, to really have an impact on our diseases. So we're going to see why in the. So let's start with the report. With this report, um, you saw the, the new one where actually the cases and numbers of death are increasing in the world. In Latin America, to start, this is the last numbers that we have um, where you see 3% of the, of the TB cases are from, from the Americas representing the world. Um, in almost 70,000 uh, 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 deaths that we are seeing. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the new report because uh, the institutions who is need to deliver this report, it, they didn't have it on time. So bureaucracy is still is there. And this also comes with another problem that when people are looking at numbers, and we are talking here about adherence, in uh, abandoning, actually we are seeing that the international corporations are really abandoning Latin America. And you're going to see later what's going on. And um, there is a lack of adherence from the uh, health institutions, from the international corporation to this uh, um, region, just because the numbers are not reflecting what its reality in our communities. In Latin America, we are still basing our, our diagnostics in, in smear microscopy, where there's a lack of uh, um, the real tools that in other parts of the world are really happening. Some good examples, like in Peru, they might have some. In Brazil, they might have some. But it's not the reality in the rest of the country. So we are being punished by, by the World Bank because uh, Latin America and some countries are more middle-income countries. So you're going to see later, but USAID, the Global Fund, with the famous transition, in, uh, is actually abandoning that region. And, and the governments are not prepared to really tackle the diseases that is causing death. So still, some, some groups seen 70,000 uh, people were dying as a just small number for us and for our communities, for our families. That means a lot and is unacceptable. Here are some of the challenges that I've been reflecting uh, uh, during the, this talk. But basically, you see the USAID, Global Fund, GIC, everybody's leaving the area. And they poured millions of dollars, like for example in Peru, where some numbers won 68 million, and others saying 500 million. Uh, into the country to try to deal with TB. But at the end, there is no sustainability of those programs. And um, at the end, the whole country is not being uh, supported in just some areas that at the end are going to continue the same. Uh, there is a very uh, negative reaction from, from uh, uh, the health institution to the participation of civil society. There is no real partnership that we really wanted to work. Um, Unfortunately, except in, in Peru, in, in Brazil, in Paraguay a little bit, in Bolivia, um, Republican Dominica, Dominica, and they have a, a, a groups a, a of uh, a, a patients associations, but unfortunately, there's in isolation, and there are not coordination, and uh, the governments are afraid of their movement. And also, they are, in some areas, they are very simple, and, and they are being used only during the World TV Day. So in, um, in Latin America, as you can see in the world, there is a, the comorbidities with tuberculosis, a, of course, association with the, with the poverty, but there is some also a, a HIV and TB a, are a, one of the co comorbidities that unfortunately in Latin America, we are, you're gonna see, uh, um, we are together, but back to back. We are not really, we really working in coordination. In some uh, countries, especially in Mexico, uh, diabetes and, and tuberculosis is, is, a, is a big problem. And uh, in other countries, they even don't know that this the, the co-infection. So it's there. We are waiting for a time bomb that's going to happen pretty soon. And as you can see, we are looking at the same beast, but from the different perspective. And there's few. Uh, uh, instance where we are really w working together. 
So at one hand, the establishment is looking at as the TV as the TV control, like in the old times. So Robert Koch and these groups are in the same position. But um, in the other hand, there's a small movement where you can see a young movement of uh, looking into the problem as a, as a the human rights uh, issue that we really need to look if we, we really want to tackle tuberculosis. It's still, the system is looking at TV as a, just an, a, a long, a, a, a sick long that it has no power. So it's still top-down position that unfortunately our, our communities have nothing to say. However, each number, each long has a story. And, and here just want to focus on, on, on two of one of the main who are in my heart all the time. And it's one of the reasons that I'm doing this for the world. Um, my friend here, Enrique, who is sitting down there, now is a big photographer, paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> he is my example of um, the failure of a real horizontal view of tuberculosis. Unfortunately, we are looking at TV as a vertical point of view in our communities who are moving to moving to different countries even those who are in jail and go to the community are left behind. Enrique had to travel for more than four countries trying to survive. And it took seven years and more to have a cure. However, who is looking at his uh, um, sequels of tuberculosis? Nobody, because sequels of TV is just Another thing outside of the health department is just his own view. However, how many cases you see of those who are lost the hearing, who are really in pain because the sequels of TV, but who cares because it's not public health care. So that's an issue that we need to see. It. My friend here, Guadalupe, it's hard, but um, she was 15 years old when, when she got uh, infected and then started getting sick and started moving in Mexico from health department to health department, tried to seek her, and she wanted really to survive. She wanted really a real treatment. However, in the last three or four months, when she sent me a letter, she says, Alberto, I want to survive because I want to live with my family. And I said, she was 30 years old when she died of XDRTB. So 15 years trying to survive, and she died because the system failed to treat her and to take care. Now, as you can see, eh, everybody is making plans to end TV for 2025 to 2050. Eh, everybody has their own eh, work plan, WHO, Global Fund, w, eh, um, USAID, the CDC, everybody. But however, there is one, the, the governments really sign it and they finally say, well, by 2030, we're going to uh, end TB, HIV, and malaria. So at least at this time, TB is there. During the, the Millennium Development Goals, we were just the other diseases. So it took a long time and a lot of communication, a lot of meetings in order to have a, a TB into the Development Goals. I was part of the, some of the high-level meetings. And let me tell you, health was not a priority. Everything is about economics, and just health is just the orphan of the groups. But we have in our country the responsibility to go and push the society, the, the government, to really invest in tuberculosis. Like I said, There is an abandoning and priority of those international or, uh, corporations, international organizations, where they're saying that the Americas is not a priority. So they are in Africa, in Asia, in uh, India. But suddenly, since 20, 2010, after the earthquake, and then these previous years, and then the recently May, a black wave of uh, Haitians are coming 
to Latin America. They came to Brazil to, as a refugees, but also to work in the, in the soccer, in the, in, the, in the Olympics recently. But as you might know, and our Brazilians know here, the economical and political turmoil of the country, they're saying, OK, I'm done. So more than 50,000 of uh, Haitians and Cubans are coming. Uh, uh, Congo and Uganda are coming also. They were coming to uh, uh, Brazil, and then they started moving. They came also to Colombia and to Ecuador. But all the problems that they have in those countries are making the way to the United States. That is not in Haiti or in Cuba or in Africa. That's in Tijuana, uh, the city next, next door to, to San Diego, where I live. There are more than 60,000 people waiting to cross the border because the US, they had a policy to support the Haitians. But that, uh, when they saw all this black wave in September of this year, they said, no more. So now, what are we going to do? And we are. We are not, don't get me wrong, we are not blaming the migrants of bringing diseases, even though Haiti is 200 uh, um, cases per 100,000. But they are arriving to those countries where TB is endemic. <coughs> Tijuana, for example, is 90 cases per 100,000. So they are arriving to those hot spots of tuberculosis very in very vulnerable conditions that they are exposing to the disease. Some of those are also HIV positive. And they are arriving with two, two countries into areas where there is no medication, when there is not, no tools to do a proper diagnostic. Is what is going to happen in the very near future right now? I have already cases that, that is, nobody is really taking care of. They are going to countries where, like in Brazil, I heard, they're going to freeze the funds for education and, and health for 20 years, what is going to happen with this uh, beautiful bolsa de familia that they are providing to those patients? So they, they, unfortunately, and I'm sorry, it's too dark what is happening right now. The new medications, even though they are in the, in the world, they are not in Latin America. I was very happy to have the, the pediatric fixed drugs combination, but besides Uruguay, and uh, Haiti, the rest of Latin America is going to take months or years before we have and our little kids are going to die. This is a very self-explanatory, the conditions of the comorbidities. We are, like I said, together, but far away looking for a different horizon. Some recommendations are basically very simple, just let and work in partnership with civil society. Let's see what is the problem in our region and try to adhere to those patients who are also humans in Mexico. Our movement is very small. If you put your hand in your heart and take the challenge to see really what's going to happen in 2030, we're gonna see, and I think we can, we can have hope in the world and if any of you have a problem with TV, just send me the TV list, <laughs> the, the TV links, and, I, and I'll be right there. And just let me finish with uh, joining the Liverpool team, because we are not alone. We just need to be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, I think I'm really happy at this, uh, the presentations, it's excellent presentations. Thank you all speakers. Special thank you to Deliana Garcia for making time to be here and enabling our uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, especially heartening for me to see is all these programs that uh, you know, for too long we have blamed the patient for not seeking treatment, et cetera, but now we are recognizing and we are actually doing all these protections, the social protection program, all of uh, Carlton's work, which is really empowering the patients. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent work. And thank you the, to the other two, too. 
So it is, we're moving the right direction, I feel, with people, excellent people like you working. Amazing questionnaire, I think it's very comprehensive and maybe it'll be a model for other people to use too. So that's, thank you for that. And with that, if anybody has more questions, let's just, we have a few more minutes, about six, seven minutes, let's just finish up, yeah. I would like to ask, Uh, Carlton, do you want to take that? Yeah, thank, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I, 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 I think the key to the answer is in the wording of your question. I think that we should change our mindset from inducing compliance to supporting and enabling people to, to, to complete the treatment that they need and they need to protect the people around them. So, so, so I think that if we shift our mindset from ensuring compliance to incentivizing, enabling, and informing adherence for cure, then yes, I think we can. Sandra. socioeconómico, eh, uno logra realmente generar esa, esa adherencia. Eh, yo en, en mi país suelo decir que la, la magia no está en las pastillas como las gallinas, que es comer y comer pastillas, sino realmente es pensar en el individuo como el ser humano que hay dentro y la tragedia y el dolor que lleva la persona con su diagnóstico y acompañarlo de esa manera de intervención. Creo que el éxito está en un trabajo conjunto, intersectorial, multidisciplinario, and so what she was saying is that we really need to look at this very differently. It's not that we're going to induce, but that rather if we're able to accompany our, our patients with social and support, <coughs> psychosocial supports and economic supports, that then we really are going to be able to achieve what we're looking for. Because rather than see this whole issue of medications as chickens eating from the ground, um, that we really need to see these as human beings who require accompaniment so that they're successful. Yes. Thank you. This is, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, mostly I agree because it was really interesting what I think. Um, in this time when kind of resources are being taken out of this area, you know, you almost expect that the focus would focus more on the biomedical approach, um, which is going to be very interesting. Um, So I'm not sure if I got it correct. You're asking about addressing mental health, yeah. right? Just the psychosocial. psychosocial. Yeah. So Alberto. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you for your question because this is one of the things I've been pushing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, WHO even have in, in the TV program have not given a section on mental health in, in TV as. So, as we know from our experience, the effect on the mental health of our communities is very strong. And there is not a really a comprehensive package starting from, from a guidelines for a community. However, I, 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 there is a way where there is a, a movement to deal with, we call it in, in mindfulness, uh, in, 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 um, 
a stress reduction, but also this is going to, uh, this is helping and mm -hmm. has been proven in the, in, through neuroscience. So we're working through neuroscience in order to develop this package that is already proven in cancer, in HIV, yes. it is a little bit in diabetes, but the package is for, for tuberculosis. So in, in my hope is that the mindfulness-based stress reduction is going to help the community to realize about their here and now and to their whole well-being, but to, come, to adhere to the treatment, but also to providers to see, like we said here, human to human, for the old guard looking at a long thick long, but if they are looking into the human to human, there is a very thin line between being a patient and being a provider. Fair enough. <laughs> but Dr. Evans corrected my question. I think correctly. He said that's the way we have to think. Yet my question was conventional. So I would ask, are any of the people who design the trial going to design a trial which tests the words I use against the words words I use and the program that would represent what those words represent against, directly against the, the program that he used. His first study where he out, showed the social issues outranking these including mm -hmm. may, may have, his initial cut at that might include both compliance with conventional reasons or the regular physician being happy with compliance. I'm just cooking this up. <laughs> um, and, and so we as a society respond to data, p-values, and if you guys could construct a, a, a study in, in which you examine the benefits of, of becoming better society members and the feeling you had a chance and the feeling that everybody was on your side even with this miserable disease against the old look, you know, you've taken your medicine. You damn well know that. Yeah. Uh, God. Uh, I think that's an excellent suggestion, and I'm sorry that you can talk to Carlton later, we are out of time, but Enrique wanted to say something quickly, and I want to give my friend Enrique yeah. another yeah. floor, just a quick minute. Yeah. Uh, well, Uh, uh, thank, th thank you so much for, for a little time. Uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, your presentation was amazing. I really appreciate it. I think it's, it's very important to try to uh, have a, a meeting a, a, a days before, and I was talking about share the best practice. I think it, this is a good one. I try to you know apply maybe Alberto in some other countries. We always talk it about the big countries. Uh, Unfortunately, we, we hide incidents of TB like Peru, like Brazil, but the small countries, my, my case, it began in, in Panama, then I had to travel to Peru, I got, I got good friends in Peru, they, they, they actually, I, they take my first MDR treatment, and it works well. Uh, later than that, I don't know what happened, but a year later, I, it relapsed again, so well, uh, important thing, I'm here. Uh, important thing is, a. Uh, I took a bunch of pills every in day, you know, uh, more than 20, 25 pills plus the, you know, intravenous. And I, I, and I think really, I think that the, the, the TB, it's, it's a divide like 33% in mind, 33% in your heart, and 33% on the lung. 
but which was my case. So it, it's, we are human beings. Uh, imagine that it's not like other maybe disease, uh, and I, I, I and I I I don't try to make pity myself, but it, this this disease isolate mentally. You know, you, you feel like, like alone uh, because you, you you care about your family to get contagious. So it's very important to understand uh, that that there is, for, for, for example, you are laid on a bed, you have to rest, but you are worried about your family. They don't have anything to food. Uh, you you are the mainly support of your family, uh, and, and and you feel frustrated because you can do anything. Plus, you have to take the pills. Uh, uh, I was lucky because I tried to myself tried to survive. Uh, I sold everything I had. I traveled to one place to another, but uh, most of the people can't do that. They just uh, lay on the bed. Uh, if the if the system. It uh, doesn't work well. It's a very big problem. You have to uh, raise your voices, and, and most of the cases, uh, they can do that. So my, my, my final words is try to understand the situation of the patient. It's not only to take the medicine. It's uh, all, all the things around, you know, around that situation, economical, uh, mentally, uh, plus you have a, a, a drug addict or, or a alcoholic. So it's, it's, uh, you, you have to understand, um, uh, understand that feelings. Uh, and I think a socioeconomic situation analysis, like, like Dr. Evans uh, uh, made a, uh, his study, it's very, very important because it's not just about a, a give the money, no. It's just about taking care to understand, to try, you know, push. A, a, you can do that. It's a very long road. For me, it was more than seven years. But uh, I, you know, I received support. I received support, mentally support, family support, friend support. So it's that very important. See, not, don't just only take the pills. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.